Good evening. I'm the Reverend Diane Daugert. I use she, her pronouns, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Nashville for the annual Robert C. Palmer Lecture on Human Rights. The lecture series, named in honor of the first minister called to serve here, to serve the church, is an expression of the congregation's mission to create community, nurture spiritual growth, and act on our values in the larger world. Some recent lecture presenters have been the Reverend Mary Catherine Morn, a former minister of the church who is now serving as executive director of the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee, Congressman Jim Cooper, Rashidat Fatuga, founder and CEO of Gideon's, Gideon's, <clears throat> Gideon's Army, Lindsey Crinks, co-founder and director of education of Open Table Nashville, and Dr. Elias Ortega, president of Meadville Lombard Theological School. I want to thank the Palmer Lecture Action Team and everyone whose efforts make this event possible. I'm so grateful to each and every person who is joining us this evening in person and on Zoom. I hope those of you who are able will stay for a reception following the lecture. And I now invite Gloria Hauser to introduce this year's lecturer. I like this step, thank you. I'm Gloria Hauser, and it's my privilege today to introduce Olivia. If you look inside your program, you will see her biography, which is extensive. Uh, it is kind of amazing that she's 20 years younger than me and she's already accomplished so much. But before I get to that, I want, I want to uh, bring up something. If you recall, originally we had scheduled the Palmer uh, Human Rights Lecture in February, but Weather decided to do something different with us. And so we were looking at another date. And so we were looking at a date that was going to work for the church and going to work for Olivia. And we came up with this date and then realized, oh, that's the day before Easter. And people were concerned with whether we get a good turnout or not. And I thought, I thought this is fabulous. What a great uh, link, the fact that during Easter, we're talking about persecution. We're talking about death. We're talking about rebirth. My gosh. And we've got Olivia. So what, what, a, what, a, what a wonderful uh, link to those uh, themes. One of the things that when you look at her biography, you're thinking, she, She's done all these things. She's been in the Navy. She's seen action. She's been an engineer. She's ran a hundred million budget, budget. What more is there? Well, there's a lot more. I want to tell you a little bit about the Olivia I know. This, this gives you the facts, but I want to give you the heart. When I met Olivia a little over a year ago, what I found was she was a woman who stood in her truth no matter what. And there was no BS, there was no trying to shave things to fit the audience. She is who she is, and she stands in her truth. And one of the things she told me, because I was a little hesitant, because I'm pretty ignorant on the subject of transgender, and I didn't want to be offensive. And one of the things she said to me was, you can ask me anything. And she absolutely meant that. And with an open heart, I present you Olivia Hill. I'm gonna slide the stool over. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gloria. I, I remember that. We actually set out at your carport in my car and we asked questions and I told you, I said, there's really nothing you can't ask me. And I mean that. Uh, a lot of times I'm the very first trans person a lot of people have ever met. And so I go out of my way to make sure that I'm open and that I will answer anything that you want to know. So my name is Olivia Hill. I am the first trans woman ever elected in the state of Tennessee. 
and uh, I ran. I ran my whole race as a qualified human. I ran for a right to sit at the table. I didn't wave a flag to say that I was trans. I didn't run as a, as a woman. I didn't run as the first woman or the first trans woman. I ran as a qualified human to sit at the table. And that's what we did and that's what we won. And, and I'm so honored to be standing here before you. Uh, I was asked to speak a little bit about some legislation that's going on and, and uh, I had planned to talk a little bit about it and I decided I didn't want to because I didn't want to bring the whole mood down of all the stuff that's going on. Um, but I do want to talk about uh, Senate Bill uh, 1949, the bathroom bill, and thanks to the amazing effort of a lot of people that are in this room, uh, with TEP and Pride and everybody else who showed up, and, and so many people at the uh, Balcony Brigade, uh, they sent it to summer studies, and it's pretty much gone. So, so there's that. So I like to start out some of these things to just tell you a little bit about me because some of the things that I get asked all the time is, uh, so when did you decide you wanted to be a woman? <laughs> and, and, and the answer is, is I never made that decision. I've always felt like me. And so at a small child, I always felt like myself. I wore my mother's slips. If those of you remember the women from the 50s and 60s, they were very ornate and they had lace and they had an elastic and I would pull it up to here like a ball gown and I, I wore my grandmother's wigs and I played with makeup and I just felt like me. I went through life and those of you that are old enough, I used to mimic uh, Geraldine from Flip Wilson. My grandmother, when she had these big parties, she'd go, dude, go Geraldine. And so I would go down the hall, what you see is what you get. <laughs> and so I just felt like me. But then at age 10, I wanted to start wearing dresses to school. And that's when I got to talk. And I was uh, sent to a psychiatrist for, uh, for two years to teach me that I had to be a boy, like boy things, and do boy stuff. At the same time, my mom signed me up for Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, football, baseball, basketball, and every other manly thing she could do to try to fix her broken child who thinks he's a girl. Because transgender is not a word that was spoken in 1975. And so, that was the start of me feeling like I was broken. As I started to get older and I got into dating age, every girl that I dated uh, seemed to break up with me because I was just a little too feminine. And so I tried really hard to just mimic some of the men on TV. Uh, around 16, I finally connected with some folks at Hillwood. I got with some of the alpha jocks and started hanging around the cool crowd and trying my best to just mimic everybody to hang out. I, I met a nice lady. We started to date. We dated for a few years. And then at, at 19, uh, she broke up with me and said that I was the only person she'd ever dated. And it absolutely broke my heart because I thought this is the only woman in the world that believes my lie. I'm trying to be this guy and she's the only one that believes it. And so I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I join the Navy, they'll fix me because they fixed Richard Gere and an officer and a gentleman. So they'll fix me. <laughs> And so I went to the Navy thinking that, you know, I'm, I'm broken and, and I feel like me on the inside. I feel very feminine. I feel like a woman, but I'm not supposed to feel that way. And so I want to go somewhere that'll fix me and make that, that happen. <clears throat> Around the third or fourth week of, of boot camp is when uh, the blanket party started. And, and a blanket party in the military is when they take and wait for you to be asleep and they throw a blanket over you. Three or four people on either side hold it down and all 90 plus people come and beat you up. I had my nose broke, I had a couple of ribs cracked, I had my, my jaw busted and I was beaten up several times. And the last time that I was beaten up, as soon as I felt the tension of the blanket leave, I shot out like a rocket and I went and hid in the shower. And I stood there with my, my back against the wall to just try to feel safe, knowing that no one can come behind me and I can at least see what's going on in front of me. That morning at Revel at 6 a.m., the company commander came in, Petty Officer Standard, not that I'll ever remember the guy, I'm just saying, uh, looked at me and said, well, what the heck happened to you? And I didn't want to get anybody in trouble. I didn't want to stir anything up. And so I said, sir, I fell down the steps. He said, I suggest you man up and, and pay attention to what you're doing since this is the first floor. And so I knew at that moment that I needed to pull myself together. I needed to hide this side of me. If I wanted to survive and I wanted to live, I needed to hide every ounce of this of me everywhere I could. So I, I, I survived boot camp. My first duty station was Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. I got there and, and, and I just really tried to man myself up. 
It's where I'll develop this voice, and I tried to be just as manly and, and as alpha as I could possibly be. I got in so many fights that people left me alone. I continued on for uh, 10 years. I did three deployments, two of which were in the Persian Gulf. I, did, I saw combat in Desert Storm. Uh, according to the Norfolk newspaper, we were the first East Coast destroyer to shoot Tomahawk cruise missiles that started Desert Storm. Um, and then after 10 years, I got out. I came home to Nashville where I started working at Vanderbilt at the power plant. Uh, I started at the bottom shoveling coal. Uh, but I really started to develop this really kind of alpha exterior. People really just kind of left me alone. And I grew a beard, I had a beard down to here, I, I, I was kind of aggressive to people, and I, and I felt like that was my safe place. The more aggressive I am and the more exterior I am, the more people will leave me alone. So I continued on uh, until uh, 2015 when my mother passed, and that's when I tell people my egg cracked, and, and I couldn't live the lie anymore. I knew that at that moment I had to be me. I didn't know what it was going to cost me. I didn't know what I was going to have to go through. But I knew at that moment that I had to stop living the lie. It took me another two years before I was able to get the courage to actually start to come out and start the process. And so in January of 2018, I came out to my employer, Vanderbilt University. I started taking estrogen that year. I started planning everything. I started going through the stuff that is required for a trans person. The difference between someone who's trans and someone who's LGBT is a lot of the, the, the gay and lesbian community have the ability to skirt straight privilege and hide. And as long as you stand up straight and you don't wear anything really flamboyant and you just kind of blend in and you can walk down the street and nobody says anything to you. But when you first start out as trans and I still had my other voice, I had to take an awful lot of classes to get to where I'm at now. And I sounded very different. I looked very different. I had very, very short hair. I was very masculine looking. And, and you hear an awful lot of hateful things as you're just walking down the street. I, I describe it to people my first probably eight months of, of being trans. It's like walking downtown on a Friday night completely naked. People stare. People look. People say an awful lot of hurtful things. People throw things at you. But as a trans person, the only way to get to each level is you have to live your truth. Because to start estrogen, you have to go to a, a therapist and you have to have an assessment letter to prove that you have gender dysphoria. And then once you do that, you have to go through and have another assessment letter to actually have the surgery. And so I went to go get my second uh, letter. I'd already started estrogen, I'm moving right along. I'm already on the waiting list to, to have my surgery. And she looked at me and she's like, Olivia, I don't think you're ready. And I was like, um, Surgery's February the 20th. What do you mean I'm not ready? I'm ready. And she's like, I just don't think you're ready. And if she doesn't sign my assessment letter, I'm not going to be able to move forward. And, and so we had a long talk that night. And, and I fired her as a therapist. And, and I went home and I cried. And I thought, wait a minute. What if she's right? What if I'm not ready? And so I started to really push myself, and I went everywhere I could possibly go as me. I went to a redneck bar in Dixon, Tennessee. I went to a couple of biker bars. I went to the racetrack at the fairgrounds and watched a race. I tried to go everywhere I could possibly go to live my truth and be me and prove to her, but more importantly to myself, of who I am. Shortly after that, in February the 20th, 2019, I just came up with this crazy harebrained idea to do top and bottom surgery the same day. Uh, six weeks later, uh, I had 11 and a half hour surgery on my face, and six weeks later, I went back to work running a power plant at Vanderbilt University. The thing that really rocked my world the most out of everything, uh, and, I, and I went through a dark phase right after my surgery, because when, before you have surgery, they, they worry about you having a blood clot, and so they take you off of all your hormones uh, six to eight weeks before your surgery, and then you can't start anything up for six to eight weeks after, but because I had surgery stacked up, I went from before, right around Thanksgiving of 2018 till almost May of 2019 without any hormones at all. It threw me into uh, 
menopause and I went through every single thing that every woman goes through in full menopause and then right back into uh, puberty when I started estrogen back over again. But in my dark phase, I had a hard time because when you come off your hormones, it really just twists your brains and your, your emotions. And I decided that, that um, I listened to an awful lot of self-help tapes and motivational speeches. And one of the things that rang true with me was what gives you the greatest joy? Should I break it? And whatever, think about what gives you the greatest joy and, and, and find a way to do that a lot. And so what gives me joy is to do something for someone else, especially when you have an opportunity to do something for someone else that they don't know that you did it. And so after I had my surgeries and I went back to work, I told you that because there's another story coming that's gonna connect with that. I tried everything that I could do to be prepared for the, for the transphobia that I was gonna get when I got back to work because I used to run a power plant uh, and, and every man that worked for me, it was what you would imagine that you see on TV working on oil rigs or uh, in an oil field, just your alpha rough, rough neck guys. And so I tried everything I could do to be prepared for the transphobia that I was gonna get. And I had almost none of it. Almost everything that I received was plain old sexism. Honey, won't you go sit in the office? This is men's work. And I was like, <clears throat> excuse me, sir. Um, you realize that I, I hired you and I trained you. So what do you mean I should go sit in the office? Well, this is women's work, you know. If it was easy, women and children would do it for less money. And it was at that moment that it completely rocked my world. And I started paying attention. And never in my life, pre-transition, have I had a grown man come to me and correct me in public as if he has the authority to do so. But I am told now, if I'm parked correctly in the lines, no, honey, you're, you're too far over this way. Just turn your steering wheel this way, and it, what's wrong? Smile, are you mad? Why don't you smile? You'd be prettier if you smile. But turn your steering wheel this way, I'll help you. And I'm like, sir, I don't need your help. <laughs> that, that usually gets their attention, and they kind of back away, and they're like, whoa, not sure what just happened, but I'm not going to help this lady anymore. But I've been stopped and corrected so many times. And so what I learned is, I lost my white male privilege that I had no idea that I had. By trade, I'm a plumber, pipe fitter, welder, high voltage electrician, diesel mechanic, jet engine mechanic, boiler specialist. And I was under the impression that I did each and every one of those on my own. I was a single parent, raised my kids by myself uh, through all the fun years from 12 on. And I would wait until they would go to sleep and I would sneak back to the plant so that I could meet with the midnight guys on third shift to teach me how to weld. And any time that they had an opportunity to go spend with friends over the weekend, I went to the plant and I hung out with the high voltage electricians when they had an outage to learn high voltage electricity. So it was me who did all that hard work. It was me who showed up to learn. It was me who went through all these efforts to, to learn all these things. It wasn't any kind of privilege. I didn't have any privilege. So I thought. But then I realized that had I showed up at midnight and said, hey, can you teach me how to weld? They'd have said, yes, sweetheart, why don't you go get us some coffee? This is men's work. And they would have never helped me or taught me a thing. And so I got heavily involved with HRC and started standing up for women's rights. And, and as things progressed, as I learned that things in my mind and things in my body were really changing. So many people don't understand with a, with a trans person in their journey and all the stuff that they go through. And in the first two years that I was on estrogen, I shrunk an inch and a half because the disc in between the vertebrae are less on a woman than they are on a man. My skin is thinner, so I cut easier, I bruise easier. My pores are smaller, so I sweat less. Because of sweat less, we have drier skin, so we have to moisturize all the time, especially in the wintertime. I lost every bit of my upper body strength within the first three months some reason I started putting on weight just right here. I don't know, it was just right here. And so, and I lost muscle mass throughout my entire body. But the thing that really got me the most was the female brain. You know this one. And so two years on estrogen, I went to my endocrinologist and she said, Olivia, how's everything going? And I was like, not good, <laughs> not good at all. And she was like, what, what's going on? Like most people, once they get to this point, you've 
you've had surgery, you've been on estrogen for a couple of years, things are going your way, most people are pretty happy. And I said, no, ma'am. And she said, well, what's going on? I said, I think there's something wrong with my brain. And she's like, what do you mean? And I said, I think there's something really wrong with my brain. And she said, well, explain that to me. And I said, well, I used to look at this bowl and think of this bowl and nothing but that bowl. And now I look at that bowl and go, wow, that's pretty sacred. I probably shouldn't have touched that. Do you think Julie thinks I think she's fat? Because yesterday I said her jeans were tight, but I meant they were tight because she looked good. <laughs> Not because she's fat. You know, she met that new guy, Mark, online, and now she's going to think that, oh, wait, I, yeah, I did pay the insurance. So, and so in my brain, and she starts laughing at me, and I'm like, um, why, why, why are you laughing at me? And I said, she said, honey, it's called a female brain. It's multitasking. It's what women do. And I'm like, holy cow, it's like this forever. It never shuts off. It never stops. <laughs> And she's like, yes, honey, it's always on. It's the only thing that I miss about pre-transition. <laughs> because I used to have the ability to take a problem and set it down and never, ever think of it ever again. <laughs> that bliss is now gone. <laughs> I, used to go to, I used to go to bed, and I would, I would go to bed, I'd sleep on the left side, I'd raise the sheet up, I would get in, I'd pull the sheet over, I'd lay on the left side, and I'd be asleep in, I don't know, maybe a minute maybe two if I had a really stressful day, maybe three minutes. Uh, those days are long gone. <laughs> now it takes a couple of videos, a stupid little game, TikTok, and maybe an hour or so. And then what I've learned is when you try to set a problem down, it just wakes you up at 3 a.m. And when it does that, it brings friends with it, guilt and anxiety. Why in the world did you say that about Julie? You know she's going to feel bad about herself now. And so and you start working your way into this little rabbit hole, and all of a sudden you go, holy cow, it's six. Now I've got to get up. I have to, no sleep. I left the clothes in the dryer. And I, the kids have got to go, and I've left the clothes in the dryer. And the brain just goes. And so it has been amazing to me to try to get used to. But it has been also very blissful because there's so many things that I can do at one time. So I moved along, and, and I got heavily involved at HRC, and, and I'm uh, fighting for women's rights because I'm, I'm like, you know, this is not right. And I got heavily involved in HRC. I got so involved with them and their steering committee that they invited me to go to uh, D.C. to their annual convention. And so I got up there, and one of the first keynote speakers was Danica Rome. And if you don't know who she is, she's the first trans woman elected in the South. And so I'm standing there, and I'm listening to her, and I'm like, oh, and it's Danica. She's like right there. And then at the end, she said, does anybody have any questions? And they had a microphone set up over here, and I'm like, oh, when am I ever going to have an opportunity to speak to Danica Rome? And so I scurried over to the thing, and I said, Danica, I said, I don't have a question, but I'm a trans woman from Nashville, Tennessee, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for blazing a trail for so many of us to come in behind you so that we can help um, other elected officials get elected and stay elected, and then she puts her hands up, stops me, and she said, come here. I'm like, what? And so she calls me up on stage, and there's a couple thousand people in the room. So I get up on stage, and she looks at me, and she hugs me, and as she's hugging me, she says, Olivia, if you want to make a difference, don't help elected officials become one. And then she spun me around and presented me to the whole crowd and said, Olivia Hill, Nashville's next politician. And I'm like, oh, cat. So I didn't know what in the world I was going to do, or what I was going to run for, or how I was going to do this. But I decided I was going to come home and figure this out. And so I got heavily involved in the judicial race. I started talking to a lot of the judges. I started talking to campaign managers. How does this go? This is my knowledge. What should I do? How should I run? And so that's when I came up with the idea to run for at-large. Because what I want to do is fix the broken parts of Nashville. And so I ran for at-large. Uh, and a lot of people out-fundraised me, but nobody outworked me. And one of the things that I learned along the way is if you really want to run a race and you want to win a hard race, is you follow Megan Berry's plan. And what I learned is she met with a new person for lunch every single day. And so that's what I did. I met with my campaign manager, Spencer Bowers, and I said, I want to meet somebody every day. And what I want to do is you put on my calendar everywhere you think I need to be and meet everybody you think I need to meet, and I'll go do that. And I work seven days a week uh, for the entire year of, of last year. 
To put that in perspective, I bought a brand new car last year in January at the start of my campaign. Uh, in January of this year, I hit 24,000 miles, and it never left Nashville. That is all just driving around Nashville, running the countywide race, meeting and greeting folks. But uh, we were able to move along, and we got into the runoff, and then we squeaked in and we won. And, and, and now the entire front row of Metro City Council is all women. So we have a female vice mayor, and when she looks out, the entire front row is all women and, and all moms. And so uh, there's also a majority of women, 20, uh, 21 of the, uh, of the people elected of the 40 body is, is women. So we kind of have a majority. When we decide to put some things together, we want something passed, we'll just kind of move along and, and, and pull together. But it says an awful lot for Nashville that we have elected that many women. And if you looked at the ju judicial race last year, how many women we put as judges in Nashville to show that Nashville, in my opinion, really is the tip of the spear of how things are changing in the South. People act like this is a horrible, ugly red state. And people, why in the world would you stay there, Libby? Why, why don't you move somewhere else that's blue, somewhere else that you could be more you? Number one, this is my hometown, this is my home state, this is where I plan to always be. But number two, the biggest thing that we have is this is not a red state. This is a blue state that doesn't have people show up to vote. There's 750,000 people that live in Davidson County. I won my race as an at-large, as a countywide race with 44,446 people. 44,000 people is what it took for me to win in an election of three quarters of a million people. That's sad, that's horrible. When I started looking at the, at the numbers, it really looks like a, a chart for, for your heart rate. And it's kind of flat, there's a couple little bumps and there's a big spike and there's flat and then there's a big spike. And what you learn is when you look at the spikes, that's a presidential race. And people show up for that. That's important. We need to show up for the presidential race. Yes, I, I vote every, every time. But what really matters is local politics. Because when you show up for all the others, you decide who's going to be the judges. How are things going to move forward with that? You decide who's going to be in the school board. So you decide how are our children going to learn? You decide who's going to be the sheriff? Who's going to be the city council? Who's going to be the vice mayor? Who's going to be the mayor? There's so many things that are way more important than just who the President of the United States is. And so I, I ask you, I plead with you, when it comes to the time to vote, that you vote in every single solitary race, that you vote often, you vote early, and that you take at least three friends with you when you go vote, because that is the only way we're gonna change this. But I honestly believe in my heart that we can change this state. We were blue somewhat at one time, and I think we can go there again. We just have to get people to vote. We have to show up. We have to get people to run. I'm looking at people out here now. There needs to be at least two to three people looking back at me right now. They're going, okay, Olivia, I'll run. And, 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 and I need that. And we need that outside of Memphis, Nashville, Chattanooga, Knoxville. We need people in, in Shubbable and Lynchburg and Savannah Jackson and other places throughout in that Tennessee that we can get people elected that we can start making some change. I'm not the type of person that I want 100% blue state because I don't think that's fair either. Because what I would love to see is a nice 50, 50, 51, 49, 52, so you know, just some, some close middle so that we can get along and we can get some things done. I don't want a completely blue state where we have it all our way because that's not right either. One of the things that I learned along the way, and it was, a, it was something that I had to really kind of wrestle with, as I started to transition and I started to receive an awful lot of hate, the thing that clicked in my brain is, as a combat veteran, I put my life on the line for every single American in this country, not just the people like me, not just the people that look like me, not just the people that vote like me, but every single solitary person. So what kind of a hypocrite, horrible person would I be to say, 
no, you can't think that way. You're not allowed to feel that way. I know I put my life on a line for you to have your freedoms, but only if they align with me. And so I don't want a blue state. I want an equality for every single person in this land. I want us to all get along. I want us to all vote, vote our conscience, and help things come together for every single person. I'm not sure where I'm at with time. Uh, so that's kind of how I got into politics. So I moved things along. I got elected, uh, and, and I have just spent my time working on what I know. Uh, I, I kind of read my resume. I'm, I'm taking my time. I'm going around. I'm meeting with all the different department heads. I've been to NDOT. I've been to Water. I've, I've spent time with the WeGo folks, and I've met with the mayor and the vice mayor and the mayor staff, and I'm working my way around to all the different departments. Because what I want to do is fix the broken parts of Nashville, and I want to concentrate on what I know and what I can do. I don't get into the weeds of some of the other things and some of the resolutions that people are passing. I stay in what I know. We all have that one boss that comes into the door and says, this is how things are going to be. I'm going to do this. I need to do something really strong to stamp my name on it and make this mine. And what I'm trying to do, and then six months later, he goes, oh, so that's why y'all don't do that anymore. And, and, and so I'm trying to avoid that. So I'm spending the first six months trying to see the lay of the land and, and try to understand how things go. I've got about 400 ideas of things I want to do, but I'm trying to meet with all the department heads to find out what I can push forward and what I can't. You know, being trans is hard. Because along the way, I've lost everything. I've lost my career. I've lost my family. I've lost my kids. I've lost friends that I've had since high school. But I want you to stop and think for a second of what your greatest wish in the whole world is. And whether it to be Miss America, to own your own company, to be a billionaire. Think about that for a second. What's your greatest wish in the whole world? And then imagine for a second how you would feel tomorrow morning if you woke up and that wish came true. And that's what it's like for me every single day of my life because I've wished and hoped to be me for 50 years. And every single day that I wake up, I get to be me. And that's something, authenticity, that no one can ever take from you because they can take your house, they can take your job, they can take your friends, they can take your money, they can take everything like that away. But they can't take away your heart. And they can't take away how you feel. And so I don't care if you're coming out as LGBT or if you own a law firm and you decide you want to be a drummer the rest of your life or if you want to join a rock band. Whatever it is to be your authentic, true self. Once you make that step and once you become you, there's really not much else in life could happen. Because I assure you, winning the lottery tomorrow could not make me an ounce happier because I am as happy as I have ever been in my entire life, because I get to be me. There's an awful lot of pitfalls and things that we, we run across in, in, in being trans, and I wanted to try to keep this pretty positive. So I've cut a few of the things out uh, of some of the things that we go through. But if you really want to get to know a trans person, and you want to really want to give a trans person a compliment, walk up to them. Sit down beside him and say, tell me your story. Because we all have one. We all have started out that we felt a certain way. I used to run a trans support group, and I've never known a trans person that didn't know at a very young age who they were. <clears throat> so many people think that, well, you know, Olivia, I'm okay with you. I don't, I don't want things happening to children, but I'm okay with you. But here's the thing, we're not doing anything to children. What's happening is, is so many people hear things, and what's happening as a majority is parents are allowing their children to socially transition. And all that is, is a mom and dad get together and say, we're okay if you wanna wear a dress to school. We're okay if you want us to call you Julie. We're okay with that. Because look at the downside of that. Let's say that three or four years goes by and the, and the child goes, you know, I don't, I don't 
think that I am trans. Maybe I'm not. What kind of lesson have you taught your child that no matter what they come up to you about, that you're going to be supportive and you're going to stand with them and they're going to feel that and that's going to carry them through the rest of their life? Once they get a little older and they get to the point of they start puberty, you can take puberty blockers. Puberty blockers were originally started for young girls that start their period at, at seven and eight years old. And so you take the puberty blockers, you take them until you're, you're 18, and then you make your decision how you want to move forward. And if 18, the same thing happens, you turn 18 and you're like, you know what, maybe, maybe I'm not trans. I don't know. I don't think I am. I thought I was, but maybe I'm not. Then you just stop taking the blockers and you have puberty at 18 years old. It doesn't do any harm at all. People act like it's all these horrible things to do, but Tylenol is way worse than puberty blockers. When I was in the Navy, uh, my last duty station, I was an uh, investigator at Naval Air Station Millington. And one of the things that I used to do was we did investigations of suicides. The number one choice of suicide in the military was Tylenol. Because if you take enough of them, within three days, you're gone. And once you get them into your body, when you take other pills and you drink too much, your body will try to get rid of that. But your body doesn't know that Tylenol is bad. So it goes through your system, it gets into your blood, and it, and it moves around. And after it, your kidneys and your liver, everything starts to shut down, and there's really nothing you can do. But that's readily available everywhere. And so I, I say that to say that let people be people. There's an awful lot of lies and scare tactics going on out there, but it's just not true. Getting towards the end of my speech and what I want to do is when I, when I finish, I want to open up for questions. And I want to extend to each and every single person here the same thing that I did with Gloria. And there honestly is not a question that you could ask me that would offend me. Because when, I, when you ask me a question and I share something with you, and you go home and you tell two people, and those two people tell two people, and they tell two people. I mean, that's how Tupperware and Amway got started. So, you know, <laughs> you just start spreading the word, and you get the word around, and you talk to everybody. And so I, I want to say that when I say you can ask me anything, that you really can, because I want people to learn. I want people to know. I want people to walk away and go, I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. Or, wow, I didn't know that. So... I, I, have a, uh, I want to end this on a little bit of a good news that I have. Uh, April 22nd, I'm having my last surgery, I think, and I'm having voice feminization surgery. And so I will walk away with a, a hopefully more feminine voice. Sadly, this voice will go away. <laughs> which, which, is, which is my wonderful screen voice. If someone calls and I look at their phone, I'm like, I don't know who that is. Yeah, can I help you? And they're like, can I speak to Olivia? I'm like, I don't know. She's free. Who is this? <laughs> and then I go, oh, hey, John, how are you? <laughs> and, and, and I continue on, but I'll lose that. The other thing is I'll lose my male privilege on the phone. Because when I can use that, I, I, I can get, hold on just a minute. Let me, let me put my husband on the phone. Yeah, what's going on? <laughs> oh, yes, sir. And, and all of a sudden, the entire attitude changes. My IQ was, goes up 30 points. I learned along the way one of the things uh, that when I went and had the oil changed on my, my car, and, and I noticed the right rear tire was a little low, and I said, when you're changing the oil, if you don't mind, can you check that right rear tire? And they're like, uh, ma'am, it's cold outside. The pressure always goes slow when it's cold outside. And I said, um, no, sir. Uh, and I gave him this whole thermodynamics answer of, of <laughs> Uh, no, sir, what happens is the molecules don't have enough energy, and so what they do is they get closer together so they can share their valences and they can transfer their ions to each other, and, they can, and, they, and it creates a void, and, and you could just see his eyes are like growing. He said, we'll look at it, ma'am, and I said, yeah, all right. Well, I, I told you, you know, I know what I'm talking about, sir. And so he goes out, they sit my cars out there for an hour or so, and it comes back, and and I said, what'd you find out about the tire? And he said, we looked at it and decided you need new tires. Have a good day. And so I learned at that moment, there's only so hard you can push them. And so you have to learn. It's, it's horrible to stand here and tell you that. But everything that I'm standing here 
complaining about and talking about are things that women have been fighting for 500 million years. You know, it, it shouldn't be that way, but it is that way. Women have to work three times as hard to only advance half as much. And I know that now is, 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 is what I have to do. But I learned that there's only so far you can do that. Now there are some advantages because huh, that's awful heavy. I wish somebody would help me with that. <laughs> and that seems to work. Uh, and, 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 and it's amazing to me how many people will walk slow just so they can open the door for you. And I'm like, thank you so very much. That's very sweet. <laughs> but uh, when it comes to having a brain, we're expected to be quiet. Because what I learned along the way is men will go out of their way to pick on each other. They call each other fat and stupid and smelly and, and all kinds of hateful things to each other's face. But as soon as you walk away, they're like, you know, we need three more like that gym. That guy's the first one here. He's the last one to leave. Hardworking guy. But, you know. And the reason why that is, is, is because what's valued in men is arrogance, strength, dominance. And so when you act tough to each other, then that's what you show out. What I also learned is women are exactly the same, but opposite. And a woman will walk up to another woman and say, oh my God, Julie, I can't believe that you wore purple and green today and put it together. I mean, nobody pulls that off the way you do. I mean, I, I really wish I could put myself together the way you do. And those yellow shoes, holy cow, that looks amazing put together. And as soon as you walk away, you go, oh, my God, we got to break into Julie's closet, put girl animals on her clothes, because that stupid woman wore purple and green again today. And did you see those horrible, ugly yellow shoes she had on? Oh, my God, does she not have a mirror? And the reason why is because what's valued most in women is soft, fragile, nice, nurturing, caring. Strength is not valued in women. So a woman would not look at another woman and say, Julie, honey, that doesn't match. <laughs> because we're not that way. You have to be nice to each other. And especially here in the South and what I call Nashville nice, it's even worse. So you really have to, I've really had to learn an awful lot and navigate a lot of things. The loss of my white male privilege that I never knew that I had rocked my world. My female brain is the other end of my bookend that really change how I look at life. My name is Olivia Hill, and I cannot tell you what an honor it's been to stand here before you all. I want to open this up for questions, and I really mean you can ask me anything. Thank you so very, very much for your time. She'll take questions in just a second, but first we're going to uh, pass the hat uh, to support the Palmer Lecture. Um, we've uh, been going for 40 years and uh, highlighted a lot of important issues, and we need to keep doing that. And uh, every year we uh, highlight a different issue, sometimes it's the same issue over and over. Uh, but we've had... Uh, lectures on the unhoused, uh, restor rest restorative justice, civil rights, GLBTQ rights, and women's reproductive rights. Uh, we've done a, uh, lectures on incarceration, the over-incarceration of folks, and uh, we want to keep it going. And uh, I'm going to make it easier for you on the collection because uh, we're, we're making, uh, we're going to play the uh, Fire of Commitment, which was written by Mary Catherine Morin and uh, Jason Shelton, both of whom were ministers here. And uh, Mary Catherine Morin was also a speaker of the Palmer Lecture because of her uh, Unitarian Universalist Service Committee uh, service. And uh, they wrote this song, it's a fabulous song. Uh, after the first verse, you know, get real intense and you want to go out and do something great and fabulous for social uh, justice 
So that's the way we're going to do it. We're going to play, play the song, and then uh, uh, in the second verse, the, uh, the greeters will come down and start collecting money. So I want you to be inspired. And I appreciate you all being here. Thank you. I have a question uh, as a parent. If a child were to come to you at, let's say, four, and say, I think I'm whatever the opposite sex is, what would you say to that parent that would be a good response to that child who may or may not really be trans, but how would you support them in letting them know that they're loved and supported no matter what? No different than you would do with any other child. If you had a child that came to you at four and says, I want to be a fireman, the thing you would say is, of course you will. Of course you are. And you'd just be supportive of that child, of, of, of what they present to you. And, and, and as that child starts to grow, and like I said earlier, if say, say that child decides at 12, and that's not really my gig. I thought I was that, but I'm really not. But they've learned that mom and dad are 100% supportive of whatever they bring, and it's going to carry them so far in life. The biggest thing a parent can do is just be supportive in any way they can with anything else that there is. If a child comes and says, I want to be a doctor, or I want to be a lawyer, or I want to be anything else, that you just support that child and say, okay, 
And if that's what's going on and it's not just a phase, then it will continue. But when you tell that child that they can't be that or that they're not that or they need to wait till they're older till they make that decision, then what you've done is you've taught that child that the way they feel is bad. And what they will do is they'll hide it. And then they'll learn that, well, maybe there's only certain things I can go to mom and dad about. I can go in with some things, but not this other stuff. And so, um, like I said, I, I've run a trans support group, and I've never known a trans person that didn't have a really good idea at a young age. I've never known an LGBT person that didn't have an idea of who they were at a very, very young age. One of the things that I, I teach people is, is my daughter's left-handed. And I tried everything I could do the first couple of years to get her to write with her right hand because everything is around right-handed people. And I learned after a couple of years that she's just left-handed. She didn't get to pick who she is. She's just born that way. And I was just born this way. And so is every other LGBT person. We are just born this way. It's not a choice. It is not something we sat around one day and decided that's something cool to do. Although I will say the bathrooms are a whole lot cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> because those of you women that don't know, there's man law in the bathroom, and you're not allowed to talk to each other. You're not allowed to look at each other. Everything is always eyes straight. You walk in, you do your business, and you don't really wash your hands. You just get out and moan on your way. But in the women's bathroom, for you men that don't know, honey, let me check your shoe. Let me zip that up for you. Here, you got lipstick right here on your teeth. Yeah. No. Oh, the other side. Yeah, there you got it. And they talk to each other, and they're clean, and they wipe up after themselves when they wash their hands on the sink. Because we're usually all moms and we're cleaning up after other people. And so they're a lot cleaner and they're a lot nicer. But great question. Thank you so very much for that. Olivia, you've had an amazing career with lots of awards and accolades. But I'm curious to know, um, since transitioning, what has been your proudest moment? Standing at the Hermitage Hotel, doing my inauguration, and having my buddy John with me. And, and standing there as the first trans woman elected, standing in a place that 100 years ago, women didn't have the right to vote. And, and, and because of Miss Phoebe Burns, and she walked up, if you don't know the story, she walked up to her son and put a note in his pocket and said, make a mama proud and be a good boy and vote for this. And so Nashville in Tennessee was the last to vote and it was the last one to pass and it was what able to get, gave us women's right to vote. It's why I chose the Hermitage Hotel. The other reason I chose the Hermitage Hotel is because as a small child, my grandmother was very proper and very big on manners. And those of you who've been in Nashville long enough, there used to be a, a, a restaurant in the basement called Arthur's. And anytime anything special happened in our family, we always went to Arthur's so that I could practice putting a napkin in my lap which fork to use, how to be proper, how to use my manners. And so it was a way to stand there and, and reflect back to something that meant an awful lot to my grandmother, to my family, and to women as a, as a whole. So to be able to stand there as my true authentic self in the Hermitage Hotel as the first trans woman, it has to be the highlight of anything I've ever done. Uh, I assume that, and hope that you had support uh, along your journey. Was there a, a difference between the number of men versus the number of women who offered you support? Sadly, no, sir. I, I, I did my journey by myself. I, uh, along the way, as, as many LGBT folks learn, you have your chosen family. And that's what I started to build around me. Uh, and, and, and it was a, an equalness of, of gay men and women who stood beside me and helped me along the way. And, and I wouldn't take anything from my chosen family. Now, there is a small update. Um, my daughter reached out to me last week. And we went and had lunch. And she was very mad. And the, and the thing that she was the maddest the most is she told me, she's like, 
Dad, I mean, Olivia, I mean, I don't know what I'm supposed to call you. And I'm like, whatever you want to call me, just the fact that you're here means something to me. And she said, you stressed our whole life, all of us growing up, to always be honest and tell the truth. Why didn't you tell us the truth about you? And that was a hard one. I, I wasn't prepared for that question. I didn't know what to do. Um, and, I, and I just fell on a sword and was honest. I said, honey, I'm scared. I didn't know what to do. Everybody that I had tried to tell walked away, and I was just scared. So once I started my transition, uh, I've learned along the way. And it's the same way for trans folks with, as, as it is with everybody in the LGBT community. Once we come out, there's a group of folks that don't follow our journey with us. There's a ton of LGBT folks that go home every single holiday with their special friend or their roommate hmm. or their friend that doesn't have family, so they're just hanging out with me. And the reason why is because if they were to go home and be honest of who that really is, they know that they would lose family. And so we lie so we can hold our family together. So once I decided to come out, um, as you will learn, and many of you know from my story, when I do something, I do something 110%. And so I came out all the way, and I came out to everybody, and I lived my truth 100%, and people just started walking away. So I um, said, so no, sir, I did it pretty much by myself. Hi, Olivia. Hey. Um, thank you for being here. I think you're one of the bravest people I've ever met or seen. Um, but the question I have is, I'm a speech-language pathologist. And I'm wondering if you have had speech and voice therapy um, and how what that experience was, because I'm kind of interested in helping people in that way. I have done a little bit of it with a good friend of mine who's trans. Um, so I wonder if you could speak to that. I understand you're having surgery, but I'm sure, have you done other work with your voice? Yes, with a therapist? I've taken an awful lot of classes at Vanderbilt University Medical Center at the Bill Wilkerson Center, if you're familiar with them. Yeah. Uh, and, and I went every week for a few months. Um, and, and, and what happens in, with, the, with the vocal cords is once someone goes through puberty and testosterone is there, that the upper portion of the vocal fold, folds start to thicken up and they open up. And so once your voice drops, it's just there. So the only thing you can do to get it up is you have to work out and you have to work your vocal cords to tighten them up and bring them together. Uh, so I think about everything I say when I say it so that I could speak in this voice. Uh, and I'm hoping that once I have the surgery that I won't have to do that anymore and I will be able to just talk. But yes, I've taken an awful lot of classes. This really is my normal voice. It's how I've talked my whole life. And so I took an awful lot of classes to go from here to here. And, and as the day progresses, as I talk more, it starts to drop. And as I, I get around people that I know and I start to, to trust you and I start to feel a little bit better and I relax and it starts to kind of drop a little bit. And after we're around for a while, it kind of gets down into this range. And, you know, if you've had whiskey with me, it's a little deeper. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it just is what it is. So I'm, I'm hoping to have surgery and not do that. But, uh, you know, it's the, it's the one last piece of my puzzle because it doesn't matter what I look like. It doesn't matter how I dress. It doesn't matter how good I get at makeup. When you get on the phone, your voice is who you are. And it's so debilitating to go through a drive through at Starbucks and hear him say, thank you, sir, come around. Or, yes, sir, how can I help you? And so that's the thing that I'm hoping to to not, and, and I know that there are an awful lot of cisgender women that, that have deeper voices and hear that on occasion. Um, but it's still hard to hear. So yes, ma'am, I've taken an awful lot of classes to get to where I'm at. Thank you so much for that. That can't be all of them, is it? We are not had anything hard yet. Yes, ma'am. So, where do I get my shoes? So I, uh, uh, I get a lot of them off of Poshmark, uh, it, but uh, most of my shoes come from Torrid because they carry stuff for bigger girls, and so um, they, they have larger sizes. 
Uh, my shoe size has shrunk. I used to wear a, a, a 15. I now wear a 13, and some I wear 12 and a half, just from my transition. Which, which I failed to mention uh, when, when I talked about all the things that changed in my body. The very first thing that changed was smell. And I had no idea how bad men smell. <laughs> <laughs> I was clueless. Uh, I used to run the power plant at Vanderbilt, and so I used to go sit in the break room and listen to the men, because those of you women know a lot of men are kind of like kids, and, and your kids, when they come home from school, you're like, how was your school? And like, fine. Did you do, have any homework? No. What did you learn today? Nothing. And a, lot of men, and a lot of men are the same way when you ask them to plant, so how are things going out there? Fine. Did you do all your maintenance? Yes. Is anything going on? No. And so you're like... Okay, so then I would go sit in the break room with them and listen to them talk, and then you hear one guy say, hey, what, what happened to that girl that you were talking to, Kim, on the phone? You met her on the line? Oh, yeah, 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 she called. I was standing there by number two feet pump. That thing was making so much noise, I had to go out in the alleyway. But as she's asking me out this weekend, I'm like, why is number two feet pump making so much noise? And so I would go down there, and I would find out that somebody hadn't done their maintenance. They didn't, they didn't grease the bearing that day. And so I went and got a grease gun, and I greased it, and, and so that's what I learned. But... About three months into my transition, I walked in the break room and I'm like, oh. I, I cannot eat my lunch in here. And so I went back to my office and I sat down and they're like, hey, Olivia, why are you not sitting here with us? I'm like, oh, you know how it is. I've got to answer these emails. And, um, you know, the boss is a real, you know, so I've got to, I've got to get this stuff done. They're like, okay. And so I kind of lived that lie for a while. But, but yes, yeah, so, so much has changed. But, but yes, I get most of my shoes come from Torrid. The biggest thing is connect with anybody with HRC, uh, anybody with TEP, Tennessee Equality Project, or PFLAG. Either one of those will really get you connected to some good people. Those people can help get you started out. They can, they can branch out. Um, what is HRC? Uh, HRC is human rights. So if you've ever seen the little blue square with the little yellow equal sign in it, that's, that's HRC, that's human rights. And so they do it, it's a big pack that they started uh, years ago to help uh, LGBT folks get elected, and it has just grown to be this big thing. So, if we don't use the microphone, the 17 are we running at time? Yes. Okay. We have 17 people on Zoom, and the only way that they hear questions is if you speak them into the microphone. So, wait for Gary. Okay. <laughs> Next. Yes, sir. So having lived under the influence of both hormones, how, what, what things can you attribute um, emotional or thought-wise to testosterone that you didn't experience when you were in an estrogen environment? Empathy. I had no idea about empathy. I used to have a, a, a thing where if somebody said something mean or hurtful or hateful that I would go, I don't care, move along. So what I was saying was, <laughs> but now since I've transitioned and, and I have, have all this estrogen in my body, when somebody says something mean and hateful, I'm like, well, you know, that's Julie. Her mom just died last year, and her husband, I think she's cheating on him. So it's okay. I know she didn't really mean it. And so we forgive ourselves all the time. I have no idea why in the world I walk around saying sorry all the time, but for some reason I say sorry all the time, even when it's not even my fault. So it's been amazing to me of how I look at things, how I see things, how I feel things, and, 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 and how I can't just set something down. Um, I tell a lot of people, uh, in, in, especially when I'm talking to couples, that men usually think about one thing. And so when they're coming home from work and they step over the laundry basket and walk around the trash can that's full, I swear to you, they did not go, that's full. I probably should fold that, but I'm not going to. Or that trash can is full, I need to take it out, but I'm not going to. What's going on is they're thinking of their ending spot at the end of the day. 
which is normally their recliner, their favorite spot on the couch, their spot on the outside of, on their deck, or wherever their ending spot of the day, so that they can take work and set it down and be done. And so it's, 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 it's blown my mind of how I look at things different, how I see things different, how I feel. I had no idea, pre-transition, the power of a good, ugly cry. It's better than punching a bag. And I can tell you the last time I cried pre-transition, it was April 20th, 1987, when my grandmother passed away. It's the, you know, I talk about my transition and I, and I lost my male privilege and I, and, I, and I have this female brain. The two biggest things that I hear from trans men when they transition is a lot of them after they're on testosterone for a while, they lose their ability to cry and they gain male privilege and they don't want it. But the problem is, is they can't hide it. They have to hide it because for them to stand up, now they're out of who they are. And so they have to just keep their mouth shut. And when you, it's amazing to me that when I'm out having dinner with someone else and they bring the check, well, they're not going to bring it to me. They're going to take it to whoever man's sitting with me because he's obviously a man and he obviously can afford it. I'm just a silly old blonde girl. I can't afford to pay for my own meal. So it, it's, it's been an awful lot of that. And, and it has really opened my eyes to how much I had that I had no idea that I had. And so one of the things I've tried in my transition to learn is to come up with another word besides privilege, because I didn't feel like I had any. And if you talk to most men, they will tell you, I don't have any privilege. Every single thing I've got, I've worked my butt off for. I got up early, I stayed late, I did the extra stuff. But what we didn't know is when I transitioned, how much harder that was to do because now I have to work three times as hard to only advance half as much and still not get anything done. And that's especially if I keep my big mouth shut and just mind my business and do what I'm supposed to do. Because as soon as we bring something up in the boardroom and say, hey, I think it's a good idea if we do blah bitty blah bitty, and they're like, good idea, honey. Anyway, so what are you gonna do? Jim, thank you so much, it's a great idea. And you're like, wait a minute, that's the same idea I just had, it's just worded it a little different. Well, don't get mad, honey. Is it that time of the month for you? What's what? Jim came up with a good idea. Let's let him have his time. And so it, it, it's, it's the life that I'm in now. And so that's why I speak every single opportunity that I get to stand up for women's rights. Because what I have found is trans rights and women's rights are the exact same thing because we're fighting for the same cause. So thank you very much for that question. It's a great question. It's been a huge learning curve for me of where I was and what I had, and what I didn't know that I had. Thank you. Wow, that was a mood killer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. When you say you want two or three people to run for something and become the next Olivia, and... Yes, ma'am, I was talking to you. Yes, ma'am. Well... <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be me. It might be her, but it's not going to be me. Um, I want, well, it, I, what I want is I want young people running for, for involved in politics, building the next generation. And I'm afraid I see that they're feeling really like it's not working for them, that they've been doing nonviolent protests and they've been organizing and things aren't changing? Well, that, that's such a great question. And, 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 we, and I hear this a lot. And, and I've talked to some folks from TEP and Valkyrie Brigade and all the folks that are standing up fighting. And here's the thing that I tell folks. What did we do last year? We had a special session. What did they accomplish? Not a darn thing. But what did they do? They had a special session. And they only had a special session because we were loud and we showed up. And we caused the governor to go, y'all gonna have to do something. I mean, there, there's just too many of them. You're gonna have to get together. I mean, we're not gonna pass anything, but we've got to show that we're getting together and do something. Which shows what we're doing is making a difference. And what we've got to do is get more young people to show up. We've gotta get more people to vote. We've got to get amazing people like yourself to run. 
We've got to get people on a school board. We've got to get people to run for other offices, to run, to get into committees and to get on boards and help people and get involved in politics. There's so many other different boards out there that you people can get involved in and get connected with the right people to get more involved. Because I'll be honest with you, three years ago, I was a person that voted in every single presidential race and that was it. I had, I had no idea of anything about politics. I didn't know anything about local politics and everything that I've learned has been a crash course in the last three years. And I'm telling you that to say that, yes, ma'am, you can run and I'll be glad to help you in any way you can. And if you won't, I'll make my first donation to your campaign if you'll run. <laughs> no pressure though, just say it. That's it. Thank you all so very, very much.